Thank you, Janice. We appreciate that. Some, well, this one thought is a curious thought, is it not? It's a good one. Maybe we haven't thought about it quite that way before, that everything that is uh, of any value at all we can take in our hearts. Won't be driving my Durango up in glory. No cowboy boots. Maybe a new pair, I'm not sure. Not the ones we're presently wearing, that's for sure. Thank you. Boy, a lot of neat thoughts for us this morning. Let's pray together. Lord, we do thank you for the song, and it's reminded us of many important truths, and once again, it's prompted us to think of glory, and we realize that uh, we live different lives when we keep an eye to the sky. We also recognize that that is the very call of Christ on on our lives, and so I pray that it might more and more be true in practical ways. Our, our lives are so easily consumed with physical things. And even as uh, I rehearsed yesterday with uh, a beloved one, these things will not pass the test of fire. They will be consumed. We take none of these things with us. And in light of that, I pray that you might help us to live Yes. Now, as it relates to our study, we're excited about it, and I pray that you would uh, bless this time so that in turn we can be a blessing to others. We pray this in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. The names of God, what a blessed study. One God, many names. We are going to continue to rehearse that each and every time that we meet together in light of God's multifold names. One God, many blessed names. Each name is like a revelation, and that's part of the reason why we've showed up again this morning, or at least I have, with a great deal of anticipation and excitement because God is about to reveal himself through his name. Each name reflects on a particular facet of God's multifaceted character, God's multifaceted conduct, and again, what joy to get to know God the Creator God, the God of the universe, the God of the Bible. What joy to get to know God intimately and personally through His names. This morning it's as if God comes and sits next to you in your pew and reaches out His anthropomorphic hand and shakes yours and introduces Himself to you as Jehovah Mekedesh. What a blessed and even challenging name. We find the name for the first time in Leviticus chapter 20 and verse 8. I'm going to take you back there in case you're not there. The reason why some of you are there is because you know this was our scripture reading. We head back to Leviticus chapter 20. I will remind you quickly of a single verse now. Verse 8. And this again is the first time of a number now of times that we find this particular name for God, Jehovah Mekedesh. It is verse 8, And you shall keep my statutes and do them, for my name is Jehovah Mekedesh. Translated, I am the Lord who sanctifies you. Jehovah Mekedesh. We have the Jehovah part down pat. The Jehovah part of God's name reminds us that he is the loving but just judge. The Mekedesh is new to us, and what a tremendous blessing is inherent in this name which God is sporting. The word Mekedesh actually comes from the root Hebrew word kadash, and it means to separate, to set apart, to divide. It's found some 700 times in the Old Testament, this particular word, this Hebrew word kadash, in the English Mekedesh. It's found some 700 times in the Old Testament. It's translated by the following English words, sanctified, 
holy, hallowed, and uh, consecrated. There is, however, something very distinctive. And by the way, what we just said is most familiar to most of us. And we've heard a lot about sanctification, and we've heard a lot about holiness. But get ready <laughs> to be refreshed and challenged in relationship to this all-important thought, this most important truth pertaining, first of all, to the character of God and then the call of God on our lives. There's, very, there, there's something very distinctive about the term, mekedesh. It has a defensive and also an offensive side to it. It has a negative and also a positive aspect to the name, to the meaning of the word. It doesn't mean only to set apart from something, but inherent in the term is the offensive idea, the positive idea of being, of being delivered unto something else. I didn't express that well, We'll try it again. It means not only to be set apart from something, but also to be delivered unto something else. Inherent in the word are both of these aspects. You know, it's one thing to be set apart, but then we could just be left hanging. And that would pave the way for not only our confusion, but ultimately even our despair. Because we'd be saying, well, I've been set apart from something, but what have I been set apart unto? Where do I go from here? And I want you to know that inherent in the word, in the name, is that very idea. We have been set apart from one thing and unto another. The, the word, I wish you had the opportunity to explore the context of the word as it's found throughout the Old Testament. Again, some 700 times it would take a student of the word a long time to fully explore all that. But one of the things that impresses you as you do that or were you to have the opportunity to do that is you would be impressed with the fact that although the word is applied to people, places, and things, each time that it is, regardless of whether it's talking about a person or a place or a thing, each time that the term in the context of Scripture is applied to a person, place, or thing, it always brings it, whatever it is, person, place, or thing, it always brings it into contact with God. I'll say it again. It always brings the thing into contact with God. It's a neat thought, and I trust that the Spirit of God will help us keep a, that on a back burner this morning. Let me take you back to the name then, Jehovah Mekedesh, and what we desire to do this morning, and we will be efficient in doing so, is, is to make three crucial observations about the name. By the way, I wanted to give you a further interpretation then. In Leviticus 20 and verse 8, we have this interpretation of the name Jehovah Mekadesh, the Lord who sanctifies you. But we now understand, based upon the way in which the term is used consistently throughout the Old Testament, that a literal translation of the name Jehovah Mekadesh would go like this, the Lord who sanctifies you unto himself. May I say it again? Jehovah Mekadesh, the Lord who sanctifies you unto himself. Now having said just that much, we note three crucial observations concerning the name and the meaning of it. Ultimately, the God who is sporting the name. Crucial observation number one. The Lord is totally and completely and fully and perfectly set apart from everything, but we note too, the Lord is perfectly set apart from all other gods. 
Now, that's not a new revelation to us because that's one of the things that the Spirit of God through this study has been bringing to our attention each and every Sunday morning when we've showed up to allow God to introduce himself to us via all of these different blessed names. We have, right from the word go, seen this amazing contrast between the God of the Bible. And this is such an encouragement to me to know that we are on the right track, to know that we're traveling on the right road, to know that we're in the process of pursuing the right God. It's kind of nice to know that there really is no other God, so we ought not to be confused, but the fact of the matter is, is that man, as we've noted in times past, in his pride and his prideful and rebellious heart, he's created all kinds of other gods to compete with, quote-unquote, the one true living God, the God of the Bible, the God who created you, the God who loved us and gave himself for us. But the name Jehovah Makedesh states unequivocally clear that God stands alone. He is completely and totally, yea, perfectly set apart from all other gods. But a second application, not only is he perfectly set apart from all other gods, which in reality are no gods, and by the way, one of the prophets says it just like that. I like it. Speaking of the false gods, he says, who are no gods. And we understand that. But the name not only makes us come to face to face with the reality, the fact that God is perfectly set apart from all other gods, but especially it prompts us to be reminded of this morning and ultimately to embrace the biblical reality this absolute truth of God's absolute character, that God is perfectly set apart, fully and completely set apart from sin. Now note it well with me, it's not a new thought. It is crucial and important. God, the God of the Bible, the Creator God, is perfectly, fully, completely set apart from sin. So much so, and I just rehearsed this this past week, that the prophet Habakkuk, in chapter 1 and verse 13 of his little prophetic book, says that God is, quote, of a purer eye than to behold evil or to look on iniquity. May I say it to you again? The prophet Habakkuk writes concerning God and says that he is of a purer eye than to behold evil and to look on Iniquity. Now we could spend all of our time, it's a wonderful character trait when everything is said and done, we could spend all of our time just reveling in this character trait of God, the fact that God is set apart from sin. See, this is the name that sets forth God's holiness. If you review the names, you, again, each name has its particular focus, and when you come to Jehovah Makedesh, you're going to say, that's God's holy name. That's the name that sets forth God's holiness, the fact that he is set apart from sin. And again, when everything is said and done, we are glad for that. But it presents to us a humanly insurmountable problem that God is completely perfectly, fully set apart from sin. It presents to us a humanly insurmountable problem. And you know what that problem is. God, Jehovah Makedesh, is perfectly set apart from sin, but I am a sinner. That's a big, 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 big problem. And because we're talking about the fact that it's me who is a sinner, that it's my sin that's the problem, you can understand that really it's a hopeless situation. There's nothing I can do about it because it's my sin. This great God of the Bible, holy, 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 completely and totally, perfectly set apart from sin, and here I stand as a sinner. Humanly, 
humanly hopeless, insurmountable. Because of Romans 3.10, there is none righteous, no, not one. We like David's sort of famous for inserting our name in John 3.16, and that's an absolutely wonderful exercise, and you ought to do that this morning. But we like inserting our names. We hesitate to insert our name there, and then we like inserting our names in other places, like in Romans 3.10. There is none righteous save for Tom Teal. There is none righteous save for Tom Teal. And all, save for Tom Till, fallen short of the glory of God. But there are no commas. Mine would be the last name that would find its way into inspired text from that standpoint. Romans 3.10 says, There is none righteous, no, not one. I, you know, that's confusing to me, but it's not confusing to a six-year-old little boy How is that? What part of that don't we understand? Honestly, it's one of the things we rehearse it every time we have an opportunity as it relates to our great and deep love for young people. That's one of the things that we can be so excited about in offering to our young people the great God of the Bible. He just speaks plainly. What part of that don't we understand? There is none righteous. No, not one. Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. In Romans 5.12, wherefore as by one man sin entered into the world and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for all have sinned. What part don't we understand? But again, we listen to these verses with human pride. And so... It does not grip our hearts. God is perfectly set apart from sin. I am a sinner. Now, if that's all we recognize, I'd in turn realize why you wouldn't want to come. And in fact, uh, if that's all we knew, then we'd have every reason to leave here and be in total despair. But that's not all we know. Crucial observation number two. God has paved the way for you and I to be positionally holy. Listen now. Observation number one, God is perfectly set apart from sin, problem. We are sinners. We've broken God's law. We've disobeyed. But it's led us to crucial observation number two, that God, and it must be him, God, has paved the way for you and I to be sanctified, set apart like him positionally. This is a wonderful thought. We've rehearsed it many times here at Calvary. To move from the status of being a sinner condemned by his sin, separated from God, to a son eternally secure in the family of God. May I say it again? This wonderful transaction, a repositioning, the possibility of us moving from the status of being a sinner separated from God to a son or daughter eternally secure in the Savior. It is a grand and glorious truth, a wonderful prospect. You say, well, how, how, how could God do that? God being perfectly set apart from sin, us being sinners, how has God paved the way for us to be set apart like him? Positionally. It all boils down to his son, you know it well. 
Romans 5, 8, but God commended his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. How many times have we quoted 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 21? He, the Lord Jesus Christ, who knew no sin, became sin for us that we might be made the righteous in God. Isaiah 53, mm. Verses 4 through 6. But he, the Lord Jesus Christ, was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord Jehovah, the just judge, but a heart full of love, has caused to come crushing down on his only begotten son the penalty and condemnation of your and my sin. Isaiah 53, 6. All we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Those of you that know the gospel narrative recall that as Christ hung on the cross, he made a number of statements, his fourth cross cry. Christ cried it in the Aramaic language, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, interpreted for us, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? This point in time that so many of us have come to grips with in times past where the Lord Jesus Christ out of deep, incomprehensible love for us, literally took our place on Calvary's cross. He literally bore the condemnation and penalty of our sin. He suffered through our hell so that you and I would not have to. That's how God did it. This wonderful transaction that's afforded us, this wonderful repositioning, how could a righteous and holy God ever do anything like that, it was through the sacrifice of his only begotten son. It was God himself bearing the penalty for our sin on Calvary's cross. That's how God did it. And what do we do about that? Or a little bit more specific in light of this second crucial observation that God has paved the way for us to be sanctified positionally, set apart from sin. How does that become a practical reality in my life? By simply receiving the Lord Jesus Christ. Embracing God's solution to your sin to mine. There is no other way the Bible makes it so very clear. There is salvation certainly in no other name, but in nothing else as well. It is Christ, in Christ alone. There's nothing we can do. We can only receive the free gift of eternal life that comes to us through the Lord Jesus Christ and His sacrifice on Calvary. We cannot work our way out of this problem that sin presents to us. Again, it is a humanly insurmountable problem. That's why God had to step in and do what needed to be done in order to pave the way for you and I to be saved. It's crucial truth number two in relationship to this blessed name Jehovah Mekadesh. That Jehovah Mekadesh, through the sacrifice of his son on Calvary's cross, has paved the way for you and I to be set apart to be positionally holy. And all of that and more is ours simply for the asking. Now I want to do something with you that will provide a good transition between crucial observation number two and number three, which is our final observation. Turn with me, if you would, to Ezekiel chapter 22.
Ezekiel chapter 22, and we look for the sake of time at a single verse. It's verse 26. I'm not asking the question because I don't want you to raise your hand, but I'd be really interested in knowing how many of us here this morning this is a familiar verse to us. Ezekiel chapter 22 and verse 26. There is a treasure here, but it's tough. Ezekiel 22 and verse 26 reads, Her priests, speaking of Israel's priests, Ezekiel, by the way, is writing during the captivity, the Babylonian captivity. He's a prophet called of God to continue to minister to the nation in her exile. So he continues to speak on behalf of God. And we're jumping in here and looking at verse 26. Israel's priests have violated my law and have profaned my holy things. By the way, the word holy there is our Hebrew word, Kadesh, Jehovah, Mekadesh. We find the word holy again in just a moment. I start by way of reading at the beginning of the verse. Her priests have violated my law and have profaned mine holy things. They have notice. We're praying that the Spirit of God would write it on the fleshly tablets of our hearts. They have put no difference between the holy, there's our word again, which is really one of God's names. I read the phrase again. The Israel's priests have put no difference between the holy and the profane. Neither have they shown difference between the unclean and the clean and have hidden their eyes from my Sabbaths, for I am profaned among them. I'll tell you something, if you are a normal Christian, sort of like Pastor Tom, and if you've read that verse with understanding, then inside, maybe not physically, but inside we're squirming in our seat just a little bit because we know that Israel's priests' sins are constantly knocking at our door. And the fact of the matter is, from a general standpoint, we have become a people who are no longer putting a difference between what is holy and what is not holy. We've become a people who are no longer putting a difference between what pleases God and what does not please God. I want to run with that by way of application in just a moment, but there is a whole nother angle and a whole nother way in which we need to read this verse. But before I tell you that, I want you to understand the meaning of one of the words that is here, this phrase, to put a difference. I've just been so bold as to say that generally speaking, even among God's people, so few are in the process of faithfully and consistently putting a difference between what is holy and what is profane, what pleases God and what displeases Him. This, this phrase, to put a difference between, is in the Hebrew, the original language, a single word. It is kodel. Listen now, it means to divide and to decide. I want to say it again. The word means to divide and decide. Israel's priests were not doing that. They had grouped together both what was holy and profane. They had not divided. They had not decided. The idea is that you would put a difference, and we're going to see this demonstrated in just a moment. The idea is that you would divide, and then of the pieces that are left over, you would go ahead and embrace one of them. That's the call of God on our lives and certainly on the lives of Israel's priests at the time of uh, Ezekiel's writing. That is the call of God on our lives, that that ought to be actually a way of life for us, that we are constantly dividing the holy from the profane and then embracing one. And of course, you know which one. Now having said that, the actual meaning of the word Watch as we plug this back into the text. And now I want to do what I already mentioned to you, and that is we, there's two ways in which we have to read the verse, and I've never read the verse from this first way before. 
You know, you discover something, you realize later on, like later on I'm going to discover that I didn't really discover anything, that there's been a zillion other people that discovered it ahead of me. It's kind of like Solomon writing in Ecclesiastes, there's really nothing new under the sun. But you also know how exciting it is as you uh, obey 2 Timothy 2.15 and you develop, allow God to develop you into a diligent student of the word. And as you're studying and you see something that you've never seen before, that the Spirit of God enlightens your eyes, that you glean something from the text, not reading in, but reading out exegetically. You, you take something from the text that you've never chewed on before. And such is the case with this verse. Now, Bear with me, because I know you guys have probably already done this. But for me, it's brand new. This is the first way that we ought to look at the verse. And the first way in which we ought to read it. And probably the way that's relatively new to most of us. I'll tell you how I arrived at this. Let me begin to read. It says, her priests have violated my law. Now, the way that we normally interpret that is exactly what has transpired perhaps even this weekend, and I won't ask for a raise of hands, but some of us probably, more than likely, there may be someone here, and I don't know who you are, so please understand that I'm not pointing any fingers, but somebody probably here violated the speed limit this weekend and uh, ended, on, ended up being on the side of the road with your head in your hands and... Was that me? No, I, no I, I was a good boy this weekend. But that's how we'd interpret this verse, the idea that we violated the law. And, and this ought not to be the case, but really, for some of us, to me, that's a traumatic thing. In fact, I'm probably the only guy that cries when the policeman approaches the side of the vehicle, just weeps. And uh, I'm crying for my mom, and uh, he knows that he's got a... He's really got a pill on his hands. First thing I say is, can I call my mom? <laughs> That's how we interpret uh, Ezekiel 2.26. We violated his law, and it's really not that big of a deal. That's how we interpret it. It's really not that big of a deal. We've violated the law kind of like violating the speed limit. The word violated in the original language, and I've never seen it before, and I'm so thankful that God prompted me to do a word study. And those of you that take notes, it'll be worth taking the notes in relationship to this. The Hebrew word that stands behind our English word violated is the Hebrew word kamas, which doesn't mean too much to us, but this does. It actually literally means to do violence to now listen to this. To do violence to. It isn't like violating the speed limit, but here's a group of people, ultimately we'll be included in this, here's a group of people who are actually doing violence to the law. I thought that was a strange and maybe over-the-top way for Ezekiel the prophet to express himself there until I was reminded that Ezekiel the prophet is is expressing this and Moses is making uh, and, and excuse me and Ezekiel is making record of this under the inspiration of the spirit of God this is exactly the word that God had chosen so it's impossible for us for it to be over the top it's a right on word and the fact of the matter is we just haven't arrived at the gravity and the seriousness of, of the term that people would actually be doing violence to the law. And I wondered again why Ezekiel wouldn't say, well, you know, people have broken the law or people have disobeyed the law or something like that. Or again, the English word violated the law, like violating the speed limit. Why did he have to choose such a strong and graphic and serious term? Well, you're going to tell me in just a moment. I thought, there's something more here to Ezekiel 22 and verse 26 than I've ever seen before. So we continued to look. And we came to the word profane. The Hebrew word kalel. Listen. 
The word profane, as used here in our text, the Hebrew word kolel, means to pierce through with a fatal wound. Here's a group of people who have done violence to God, to God's word. And Ezekiel records that they have pierced through with a fatal wound. You know, probably, where else we find this Hebrew word, Call Lel. We've already quoted it. Isaiah 53 and verse 4. He was wounded. Kalel. Pierced through with a fatal wound. Isaiah 53, 4. Speaking of the Lord Jesus Christ, Christological Isaiah 53, absolutely amazing. The prophet Isaiah writing of Christ some 700 years before Christ would even arrive on the scene and giving us a graphic description of Christ's crucifixion on Calvary's cross. And he said the Lord Jesus Christ was fatally pierced through because of our sin. I wish I had more time to do this. I don't, and I apologize for that, but I've never seen it before. Ezekiel 22 and verse 26 is Christological through and through, and the first way in which we need to read the verse is allow the verse by way of its prophetic utterance to take us back to the cross and the day when we, because of our sin, fatally pierced through the Lord Jesus Christ. He, a willing sacrifice, doing what needed to be done in order for us to be made the righteous in him. And so we demonstrate now uh, that... Remember now, we, we're, we're called upon God to... <laughs> Remember, we're called upon God to put a difference between what is holy and what is profane. And you won't be able to read this, but I have labeled on the one side, because again, we just naturally group everything together. And, and this is what Israel's priests were doing. And in connection with the first time, the first way in which we read the verse, we realize that ultimately everything boils down to the Lord Jesus Christ. That we need to divide and then decide. Are you with me? That's the meaning of the word to put a difference. Israel wasn't doing that. Frankly, you and I, man, in his pride, are not doing that. We take things like the Lord Jesus Christ and we glue him together with all kinds of other means of salvation, for instance. That's why some of us maybe even here this morning are thinking that we can work our way to, sal to salvation into heaven. We think that we can get to glory by being a member of a church or by being baptized or by just recognizing this wonderful but false thought that I'm really not that bad. And we've just kind of all grouped everything together. We have not defied Divided, and then we have not honored the second aspect of the meaning of the word. You first divide, and then you got to decide. A lot of us are right like this. We've just grouped together the Lord Jesus Christ with every other thing and think that somehow we're okay. And so, obviously, what we need to do is divide this thing. Now, the word means to divide, but that's not all. What else do we need to do? Decide. That's where some of us are at this morning. Some of us, we just haven't divided at all, and then others have been around enough to know that there is indeed a difference between the Lord Jesus Christ and all these other things. 
And they have knowledge of that, but the fact of the matter is they have not really honored the call of God on their lives because it isn't just to divide, which so many of us haven't done, but it isn't just to divide, but it's also the import of deciding. We come back to this idea that the Lord Jesus Christ has paved the way for us to be set apart like him positionally, to be holy positionally, and we say, well, how can I make that a practical reality in my life? Pick him up! Embrace, choose, decide, that's it. Divide, put a big difference between the Lord Jesus Christ, God's solution to your sin, and all of man's solutions to sin. Put a big, big difference between the two. And then pick them up. Embrace, decide. This is John 1, 12, but as many as received him, to them gave he the power to become the sons of God. Some of us just haven't decided. Maybe divided, but we haven't decided. Man, I trust you'll do that, but we're not done. The second way that we need to read the verse relates to God's people. And again, we don't do very good. Oh, we've been saved, and we've been made holy positionally because we have separated Christ from all other means of salvation and we've embraced Jesus Christ as Savior from sin. But now we need to reread the verse and accept the reading that we normally take with Ezekiel 22 and verse 26 and realize that the call of God on our lives from a practical standpoint is day by day and moment by moment to continue to put a big difference to divide and decide between what is holy and profane, what is good and what is evil, what is pleasing to the Lord Jesus Christ and what is not. And there's a whole mess of us that are walking around just like this, haven't even gotten to the first stage of obedience of Ezekiel 22. In verse 26, I've used this illustration before, and I know I need to be quick and conclude, but I, I especially know this is a reality in our lives as it relates to, for instance, God's people and their use of television. I, I know even in my own life, there's a lot of times when I watch TV and it's just like this. I put no difference between what is evil and what is good, what is honoring to God, whose name is Jehovah Mekadesh, and what is displeasing to him. And, and so we haven't even really gotten to the first part of obedience. But again, just like we did over there, this is what we need to constantly be doing is put a division between the two, but not only divide, but also to what? Decide. Let's see now, what shall I embrace? And here's the response, the only legitimate response on the part of God's people in light of Christ's great sacrifice is that day by day, moment by moment, I'd be picking this thing up, constantly putting a division, a big difference between what is bad and what is good, what is evil and what is holy and what is displeasing to God and what is pleasing to God and by way of lifestyle that I'd be consistently and constantly picking this up, deciding and embracing it, ordering my life according to it. So I don't know where you're at today. But the challenge of God on our lives is to put a big difference. First of all, to put a big difference between God's solution to sin and man's. To put a big difference, to divide and then decide. And then for the children of God to reestablish the call of God on our lives in light of the fact that God is perfectly holy and God's children ought to be an awful lot like him to put a complete and total difference between what is good and bad, divide and then decide by way of lifestyle so that you and I practically are living a life that is worthy of Jehovah Makedish. We pray. Lord, thank you and we have uh, our time goes 
so quickly. We want to be careful. I, I don't know that we need to say too much more to your people. I, I know as it relates to me, Lord, in this name of yours, I, I appreciate so much the, the reminder in my life of the fact that I ought to, from a practical standpoint, and you know we didn't even say it like this, our people need to note this in our prayer, that the third crucial observation is that God calls us to practical holiness. Crucial observation number one, God, you are perfectly set apart from sin. Crucial observation number two, you have, though in turn, paved the way for us to be made holy positionally, and that comes to us by embracing your Son. And then crucial observation number three, may we embrace it, the children of God today. May we reaffirm it. May it be our goal in, in life to put a difference between what is holy and profane, to divide and decide, and for that to be what governs our thinking, not only day by day, but even moment by moment. You say it in your word over and over and over again in both the Old and New Testament. Be ye holy, for I am holy. That's Jehovah Mekadesh. And if we allow you to introduce yourself to us with this name and embrace it, the result of that will be holy and godly lives. And that's an exciting prospect. But we're concerned about someone who may be here this morning who has never put a difference between the Lord Jesus Christ, your God's solution to our sin, and all of man's solutions, solutions that come to him via his prideful and rebellious heart, solutions that are, if the prophet were talking about it, solutions that are no solutions at all. I trust that if there's anyone here this morning who has never yet chosen Christ, hasn't separated him from all other things and embraced him, decided on him, that they would do so even now in the quietness of this moment. With a prayer like this, Lord Jesus, I heard again of the fact that you love me, that you, that you were willing to take my place on Calvary's cross. There was a problem my sin, it separated me from you, God, Jehovah Mekadesh. But you, God, loved me so much that you sent your son. Jesus died on the cross for me. And the Bible says that if I would receive that sacrifice, if I would embrace Jesus, I'll be delivered, saved from the penalty of my sin and made, as we've mentioned, made a part of the family of God. That's my prayer this morning. If you're here this morning and you prayed that prayer as heads are bowed, eyes are closed, I would love to know. We'll do nothing to embarrass you, but I would like to be able to leave here and pray for you today. You're here this morning and you prayed that prayer inviting Christ into your heart and life. Could I see your hand? Raise it just for a moment. Lord, we thank you so much for the privilege of sitting under the ministry of your word. And uh, for those of us who know you, what a strong and powerful call and commission and command to be holy, set apart from all that is evil and sinful and profane and dishonoring and displeasing to you. And man, if we will take that up anew and afresh this morning, we know you'll be pleased. That's our closing prayer. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.